So we are living through a period right now where technology is shaking up virtually every industry. Um, and that is equally true for government, although things sometimes happen a little slower in government. Um, and I can't think of for a worker, two terms that are probably more scary than automation and artificial intelligence, right? We all want to think that there's a place for us in the future workforce. So I'd like to start by asking um, our panelists to describe how they see automation and AI playing out in their particular workforces. And I, but I want to start with Joni for sort of the, the, the big picture uh, view of this issue. Sure, hi. Um, Good to see everybody here, it's really great. I wanted to share a little story about um, the poster child for emerging technology, and that is my 89-year-old mother. So she got an iPad before I did. She has a smartphone, I still have a flip phone. But think of her, she was born in 1929, a little farm in South Carolina. I mean, it was very rustic, and today she has um, a pacemaker, she has hearing aids, she has a knee replacement. Uh, when you go visit her, you have to go in through a smart lock. Once you're in her house, you watch TV on her smart TV, and she also reads eBooks on her Kindle. And when she goes to bed, she has this little gadget she puts around her neck that if she needs help in the night, she just presses it, and the ambulance comes. Talk about technology and her time frame. And so we're starting to see it go faster and faster and faster to Robin's point. Um, so in our space, I work in federal procurement policy. We do procurement all across the government. And there's a lot of very low value added activity that happens that's being done by very highly trained contracting professionals. So we have a, a very uh, extensive certification program. So they get a lot of training and they're sitting there entering data into a system. They're sitting there, you know, typing their own letters. They're sitting there combing through proposals with like yes, no answers. Very low value work. Used to be we had clerks that might do some of that, but the clerks are gone. So now these very highly paid, highly trained people are doing it. So I see AI automation really helping them to focus on critical things where they can make a difference, where they can go out and, um, consult with their customers, they can figure out better ways to do things instead of spending so much time um, on these kind of meaningless low value tasks. And there's, so echo this across all of those mission support functions, not just procurement, but HR, um, finance. There's so many tasks. We could free up millions of hours of time for these very smart, highly educated people to do more value added work for all of us, the taxpayers. That's a really big picture. <laughs> So how about you, Bill? What, what are you seeing at DHS, or what do you see emerging? Um, well, we're looking at a lot of RPA, a lot of AI, and, and we want to tie them together in the middle. We actually come at this from a different perspective because you, you know, people may have fear of these technologies coming up. I'm in a place right now where I'm so understaffed to do the job that I need to do that I've got people, you know, we're leaving stuff undone at the end of the day. We have to kind of do just in time development of our of our um, things that we do to get you know I can't do something early because I have a deadline today and then I have a deadline tomorrow and we keep those things going so I'm already at the place where I don't have enough federal staff and I can't and I'm really not funded enough frankly at the contractor level to do the work that we need to do and what that is is the uh, the acquisition of IT and then the system engineering life cycle it's pretty much soup to nuts. You know, we start from the idea and we take it all the way to the end of life. And so um, a lot of that is still based on documentation, right? It's still based on, you know, mission needs statements, operational requirements documents, the whole nine yards, all the way through. And so until such time we get to the place where we're not really doing it in a documentation way, we need to have AI and RPA to kind of do the, get us the documents on time in the right order, and then AI to go in and take a look at some of these documents and kind of give us a, an early score on what the document looks like, right? So if a mission needs statement or something like that comes up and, I mean, if, if I can do it or one of my staff members can do it, you know, as a human, we can train AI to do the same thing and then zip these things through because there are thousands and thousands of pages. And right now, uh, as we're just discussing, we've got humans reading these things and you just can't do enough of them. Um, 
And uh, so it's actually going to help us because we're going to get the staff to be able to do more value-added work. We're going to be able to leverage our contract staff better and make them do more value-added work. And so it's really not, to me, an issue of us, you know, have the fear of AI taking over. We desperately need it because we're already behind the eight ball and we need to get on, on board as fast as we can. Marissa? Okay, thank you. Um, and again, I'm glad, glad to be here with all of you this morning. Um, I have to echo what both panelists have already said. Um, I'll take a slightly different angle. Uh, we look at fiscal service, again, as a way of transforming the way we do business and the way we manage the, government, the federal government's finances. So we provide administrative finance, or finance services to our administrative shared service customers through our treasury shared service provider, ARC. And, and then we also provide government-wide accounting services to all of federal government. So for us, this is just a really exciting opportunity to really transform the way we do those types of administrative activities. A lot of them are seen as backroom type activities, you know, things that have to get done, but they're not always, you know, perhaps the most exciting. And we're using staff to do these, these, these types of activities that are highly manual. So. In our case, it's not a situation where the staff are really concerned and don't see themselves in the picture. They're actually the ones really driving us from a shared service perspective because it allows them to, it allows us actually as, a, as an administrative shared service provider to take on additional customers without hiring additional people, helps, our, helps us lower our costs, increase our efficiencies. I mean, we're seeing things. We're also leveraging um, RPA, so we're really excited about that. We are seeing just you know huge improvements in efficiency and throughput. Um, we're expecting to see the the really the cost savings as well as we move forward with our with our process. We've got a few uh, processes ready to go into production, but we plan. Um, I think our staff are feeding us lists of like you know hundreds of things that they think that we can apply RPA to to really help help them focus on the more exciting, higher value work. You know, things they, they don't necessarily, you know, as hard as it may be to imagine, they do not enjoy going through and, you know, manually typing things, cutting and pasting activity all day. They'd much rather be providing, you know, customer service to a, a, a customer in a way that we haven't been able to before, or onboarding a new customer and helping them um, take, helping us take on that administrative work so that they can focus on their mission. So we see it as a really exciting time and, and our employees are actually pushing us. I mean, they're the ones downloading the YouTube videos and saying, hey, look what I can do, you know? So it's pretty exciting. Well, I'm, I'm glad the three of you don't see the dystopian future that <laughs> some <laughs> others have seen when it comes to AI um, and automation. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, maybe start with you, Bill. I know you're doing some pilot programs at, at DHS. Tell us a little bit about what those are and, and what you're learning. Well, the pilots that we're, we're actually looking for vendors to pilot up with us or to partner up with us, actually, because that's one of the challenges we have is that um, is to be able to fund these things, and we have to show really good ROI. And before I can do that, I've got to be using it. So you know, so we can't. We're not really in a position to go out and fund a lot of them. Um, and so that's. That's basically the challenge there. The it's pilot. It's the catch-22 of every government mission, right. right? You have to demonstrate that it's <laughs> you can get a return on investment, but you can't invest in it without money. So. Right. Exactly. Right. The pilots that we have done are, are we are in the agile space. So we, uh, the deputy undersecretary, a couple of years ago signed a, a a waiver basically for some of the acquisition policies that we that we had to follow that were quite rigorous. And uh, we took five major programs, and he said, go nuts, figure out new ways of doing business. And so um, that was very successful. We brought the full weight of the headquarters to bear and to partner up with these five programs and got them all way further along than they had been. Some of them I had been talking to back in 2014, and they hadn't been able to kind of get going. So those were all very successful. And um, But now we, we learned 18 specific things to fix the acquisition process and all the way through the system and during the life cycle. We're writing the policy right now, and when we put that into place this, this month, and then, and then we gotta go roadshow it out. But one of the in interesting things about those pilots is the 18th of those action items is AI, RPA, uh, some better way to do data analytics. So what I hope to do there is, you know, streamlines a lot these, uh, you know, the reading of these documents. We're, we're playing with some stuff our, ourselves, but we'd love to see some great pilots from some of our vendor community uh, to help us with that. And then um, the other thing is that 
I want to show the value of all the other 18 or the other 17 items, things that we did. So we, we, we streamline a bunch of processes, but as of right now, we can't show any ROI on it. So I want to get some really good data analytics so we can start building the story to show the, the benefit of the 18 things in total that we did fix. And, you know, and keep on going with that, and hopefully we can, you know, we can convert some of that money into something we can use for better, better uses. So, so Joni, is that something you could speak to the the return on investment and how you can demonstrate that? Sure. Um, but I first wanted to touch on some of the pilots that are going on in other agencies. So GSA is pretty forward leaning in this area. They have an emerging technology division. They're using RPA for things like um, compliance of of solicitations. You might know that acquisitions is a pretty risk averse field, <laughs> so that helps with that. Um, they're also doing some work around proposals coming in that I mentioned previously. Um, Defense logistics agency is doing a pilot around an automated ordering tool. So how cool would that be if you need something, you don't have to go interface with an actual person. You can go online like, gosh, like you do at home. Imagine that. Um, and so several agencies are kind of piloting it. I think maybe the most forward-leaning one is HHS. We went over and talked to their senior procurement executive, Andrea Brandon, last week. She's looking at a whole bunch of pilots of all of this emerging technology in the field of acquisition. It was really exciting. And I wanted to mention that next Wednesday at 11 o'clock, HHS has a demo. They're far enough along in this effort. They have a demo that wherever you happen to be next Wednesday, you can log in and see this technology for yourself. I, I'm going to be watching it as well. Um, but return on investment, we talked to her about that. How do you get the money for this? And it's, it's again, you have to do a pilot. So carve out a little bit of money, pr you know, prove the concept, and then you're able to possibly get some more money. It's, it's, a, tricky, it's a tricky wicket. And I know, Marissa, you, you also have been working with some robotic process automation. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that. Sure, and I can also touch on the ROI um, as well. So within Treasury, we have done a similar process. So we went through and we've developed a series of pilots you know, to, to, to get our arms around it. And I would want to share a few tips for anybody who wants to start down that path. A few things that I would share from our lessons learned are, you know, one, start small. Like Joni said, you know, carve out something that you feel like you have well documented. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be a perfect process, but just something well documented and you think that you can see some value add from. We didn't start with, you know, the most beneficial areas that we thought would give us the biggest bang for the buck. We started with things that we knew that we could manage and we just wanted to get our feet wet. Um, so first things that, you know, start small. Um, the next thing I would suggest is focus on your infrastructure. So with a pilot, you know, we, we went through the process and I think we started with a minimal level of security and just minimal things that we needed to do to get the, the test um, completed and make sure we could show the, the value. The thing about that is make sure even though you're just starting small and you want to start with the pilot process, engage your IT and your security staff very early on. We did that and it, and it was helpful, but I think we could have pushed it more to make sure that they were even more engaged, especially from a security perspective. That's going to have a huge impact in terms of taking things from pilot to production. So in some things that you're able to do in a pilot mode aren't necessarily what you would need to do in a production sort of uh, you know situation so make sure you start with a solid foundation because once once you start doing this and people can start seeing what you're able to do they you know there's no qual there has not been a crawl walk run for us it's been crawl run run faster you know so make sure that you set the foundation well so that you're prepared and able to scale up quickly um, the other thing I would say is that and I mentioned this earlier don't don't look for per perfection we we Thankfully, you know, we have a lot of accountants on our staff who really want to make sure they know every, you know, line is crossed and, you know, I is dotted. So we, we really pushed them to just get some ideas out there and get started. And that really helped. It really helped from our staffing perspective, too, because staff were able to see and came along with us. And it wasn't like we did all of this in the back room and then say, oh, ta-da, look what we did and saved you all this time and money. You know, they really were along the way with us. And that's really helped in terms of the adoption of staff um, as we've gone through this process and their support of the, of the um, work. 
To touch on the ROI, um, I would just say for us when we first got started, because we're a shared service provider, we are required to, and I think one of the other earlier um, sessions mentioned it, we have a lot of metrics about around what we do and how much time and money it takes for us to do that um, to a very low level. So I, I realize not everybody's at that same stage, but even you know as you get started, just even getting rough orders of magnitude around those types of things really helps you show the return on investment. Obviously, there does need to be an initial investment, and, and our management knew that. You know, we knew that up front that we would need to put in a little, put in some money. But because we had, you know, a pretty solid understanding of the um, what it cost us to do our work, because we we then, you know, work with our customers from that perspective, it, it helped. It really helps with the ROI. So, I'm I'm interested in how you've all sort of navigated workforce concerns, right? Because um, there is, uh, you know, as Marissa said, you had to message, you know, can't expect perfection. Um, and, and certainly h humans aren't perfect in the work they do. But there is sort of an added anxiety when you're allowing a machine to read documents. And, and I'm just wondering how you dealt with some of those, those concerns. Um, Bill? Well, I think from, you know, our concerns are basically trying to get the help and get going. I mean, it is a very interesting way to look at it. So there's a couple. One of the 18 action plans that we're doing is to do a better job of showing the value of anything that's built and to identify, we do it six months at a time for the major acquisitions, that they need to tell us pretty much high level what they're going to deliver from a business perspective over the next six to 12 months and then show us how to do it. And DHS, is, uh, the cost analysis division, has decided on um, kind of an earned value management, but the good old function point analysis, with anybody who's been around a while remembers that was you know, kind of the vogue in the, in the late 90s. But they're going to do that. But, and what they do is they actually look at the concept of operations document and pick out the verbs that said if you're saving to a database, you know, that counts for X amount of a function point. Well, Right now we get humans like counting that, or if they're clever, they're putting it in Word and doing a word search. That, that, screams, for, that screams for AI uh, to be doing that. And that's, that's kind of where we're going, right? I think that's the, that's the piece that we're trying to get done. We're not so much worried about you know, having people trained to do that. I think I've got, I've got a, one guy assigned, and his job is going to be to, not, is to come up with the checklist of what we would look at for each respective document, even if you are a human. What do we, would, what do we look at? And I have him meeting with all the subject matter experts. If we were looking at this document from your perspective, even the, the, the acquisition plans and things like, what are you looking for and how do you determine if this document is good or not? And then we want to feed that into a tool. And then, of course, we do intend to iterate. It's, gonna, you know, it's not going to be perfect at first. But ideally, you know, that's going to bear great fruit. And I think um, as far as, you know, and as far as the folks being trained to do this, I mean, we're, we're kind of picking this up at the same time we're re-picking up function point analysis. So I think in that one case, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. Um, but I think the tools are so, I don't, I'm not talking AI now, but RPA and some of, the, some of those other tools are pretty, pretty easy to pick up. And I'm not really that worried about that from, our, from a learning perspective. How about you, Joni and Marissa? Have you had workforce concerns about how this is playing out? I have heard some concerns, and we just try and reassure people um, that this is to help them be able to focus on things they would rather be doing. And some people, maybe of my generation, are a little uncomfortable with the technology of it. And it's just a matter of, of experiencing it and sort of immersing yourself in it so that you get more comfortable with it. I liken this to uh, we recently uh, finished a certification for teaching contracting people to buy digital services. So that's something we wouldn't even have, have thought about five years ago. And we did a, a challenge for that. To We knew what kind of training we didn't want. We didn't think you could go sit in a class for a week and learn how to do this. So we partnered with some really innovative companies to come up with a program where people stay in their job, but yet they spend some time on an online platform. They read articles, and then they get together with an instructor-led team to talk about what that means to them. And they're kind of immersed into digital services. And I, I see that model working with emerging technology, too. You get immersed in it. You get comfortable with it. 
and then you can start using it more effectively. And so that's the message that we're trying to get out is this is just one more tool to help our contracting folks, our acquisition folks be more effective along the lines of we have a lot of work going on in category management, meaning don't every single agency have a contract for these common items that you buy, right? Let's get together, leverage the government's volume, have some really good contracts that are easier to use. So it's along the lines of a lot of things that we're doing to try and improve the life of, I think, all of our federal employees. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. I'll, you know, and I, you've already heard me say our staff love it. So they really, I'll just touch on that a little bit and then maybe a different angle that where we have seen some hesitation. But so our staff, to give you a little bit more context there, they were engaged from the very beginning. We actually have um, some uh, innovation you know, series. Uh, we have an incubator within fiscal service so that, and basically that is where staff, not management, go and come up with ideas that they maybe want to pursue or try and they're really left to their own devices, you know, innovatively, you know, whatever technology they want to take a look at and, and explore um, where we could reap benefits. So, for us, RPA sort of came out of that type of forum where the employees, again, were really pushing and leading the ideas. It is, um, to speak to what Bill had said, we, we've seen a lot of, you know, there's not been a huge technology challenge around this type of uh, innovation, so it's been really good for us. We're able to leverage existing staff. We're retooling them. I think one of the earlier panels mentioned that, so we're actually going through a process of training some, some individuals that have sort of core competencies in these areas, and then we're tr retraining them to develop and manage the, the bots for us going forward, so that's been really successful. I will say we did develop some videos as a result of our pilots, so um, speaking with the employees who we maybe, whoever we, love, you know, if we took their process, for example, and automated it, we spoke with them about the experience and how they thought this would change their day. We actually have um, some videos as well in terms of the actual um, bots working, which is, you know, we've got some lovely music to it, but really all it is is, you know, it's a, you know, if you play at full speed, it's just a blur because the bot is just going from system to system, Excel spreadsheets, emails, and things like that and getting the work done. But it has helped sort of demystify the process and get people a little bit more comfortable with it. I think, you know, immersion is a good way to, to think of it. I will say, though, when we went through the process, our biggest concern has not been our people. It's been our auditors. As I mentioned, being from Treasury, we have auditors all over the place all the time. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we're doing from a business process perspective, the changes there incorporated whatever controls we needed. You know, we have a lot of very stringent controls in place today, so we wanted to make sure we did nothing to compromise, the, compromise those, but in fact, you know, looked for ways to enhance them. So I would say that community is where we're focusing more of our time right now and making sure they understand what our process was, how this new um, technology will work, and how it will not, you know, harm our existing controls, but in fact, improve them. So that's been an area, you know, not employee related, but definitely business, you know, from our business perspective, where we're trying to reach out and, and focus, so. Are there um, uh, operational areas where you expect to see AI and automation go next? I mean, is there, if you were to look ahead five years, what are we not using these technologies for now that we could be or maybe will be at some point? Well, I'll start very quick. I mean, the analytics of what we're doing, and we, we live with the auditors as well. JO and OIG are my buddies. We talk to them all the time. And, um, you know, one of the things they're asking always is like, okay, well, you made this decision back in like 2010. Okay, show me where that happened. I mean, come again? No, show me the meeting minutes where that was decided, and you have the evidence of that. I'm like, well, uh, kind of don't, but, you know, so we pull together as much as we can, but, you know, as feds, right, folks out in the heartland think we kick back with our feet up uh, a lot of times, but, you know, really, the, the Congress is after us 24-7 to make sure that we are doing the mandated job that, that the laws and the policies are requiring us to do. So the one thing we is challenging to do the job plus to do the the recording of everything that we do, kind of like a, a log, right, in a computer system. So that will be fabulous once we get that. I mean, that's one of the things I'll be looking at right away is to try to get, uh, uh, you know, some logs to, to basically show that we did everything and that we can show the evidence of having done it the time that we did it. You know, and maybe, you know, you know, sunlight's a little bit scary sometimes. So, you know, if we screwed up, we screwed up. But sometimes we may have done something late or whatever the case may be. But 
You know, we'd rather have the, the facts because once you get a week or two out, I just can't remember, man. I'm kind of old. So you have, to, you have to have something you can point to. And uh, that's one thing I see. But um, and I, oh, I'm sorry, Tony. I was going to say, you know, we're starting with finance. We are moving out to HR, and I would imagine there's going to be any sort of administrative service that we provide is going to be an area where we're going to look to leverage RPA. So anywhere from travel to um, procurement, it sounds like there's already a lot of good movement there. Also in our government-wide space, you know, we're starting to explore opportunities to um, improve the way we generate financial statements, look at ways we, we perform reconciliation. So for me, you know, sky's the limit in terms of administrative activities. From what I've seen from employees, we will be busy in that space for many years based on the ideas they're coming up with. So for, for us, it's really going to be focusing on those so that we can, um, you know, from a treasury perspective, we want to make sure we can take those duties on so that agencies can focus on their mission. You know, our mission is finance, so we, we enjoy doing that. Yeah, so from my perspective, um, I've, I've already talked a little bit about procurement, but what I'd like to see down the road, I know our folks, our acquisition folks, are just absolutely inundated with information, right? They get tons of emails, there's like tons of articles, there's great events like this, and they've gone through this rigid training program, but they don't actually get the training right when they need it. So I, I envision a future where I'm working on a contract, I'm, I'm figuring out this new way to get this solution for my agency, and there's some uh, AI that goes out and says, oh, this is what uh, this agency did, and this is what this vendor offers, and just help me with the whole market research thing, and, and pare down all the information into something that's actual useful, actually useful to me at the time that I need it. I know we don't have anything like that now, but that's what I'd really like to see. And actually, I'd like to just touch on that, because I think that's a great idea, and we're actually exploring that space as well from a government-wide perspective. So I mentioned, you know, I think there are agencies out there right now who are looking to use RPA to perform their IPAC reporting and their IPP, you know, vendor in invoice processing, you know, things of those along those lines. And so from a treasury perspective, we'd like to learn from agencies who are doing things like that so that we could maybe look for commonality amongst you know, those processes and then share it, you know, with each other so that it's not each one of us starting from scratch. But I think that's a really great idea and it's something we're starting to think about more in terms of not just what we can do internally, but how can we take some of these more general um, government-wide processes, especially from a finance perspective, and develop something core that could be then shared amongst agencies. And so it helps from a cost perspective, you know, so you're not all trying to ramp up and spend all that money, you know, try to figure everything out from scratch. Another thing I'd like to see is connecting people across the country. So we are really good at reaching the DC folks here, but we're not good at talking to the folks in Denver or sharing information or even knowing what each other is doing. So I really think there's a role for AI. And I wanted to, to let you know that little teaser I threw out about the HHS thing on Wednesday. Um, GovExec is nice enough to send out a link to that. So for those of you that actually want to participate, <laughs> you can do that. So we do have time for some questions. Um, if you'd like to just raise your hand and someone will be around with a mic. Thank you, great, great discussion. Uh, a, a quick question, just based on a little bit of my own personal experience. Um, done some work, uh, automation, AI, process robotics, right? And, and, and Bill, you sort of hit on the part of the point of it, right? You don't have enough people, the work continues to grow, right? Um, so, so theoretically, we, we implement these technology solutions and free up capacity of our workforce. Do you, do you have any sort of thoughts or, or maybe good examples within your organization around how that is realigned appropriately? Because my experience with these projects, they're, they're usually viewed singularly as an IT project, right? We're going to implement this the solution and it's going to make our lives easier and it and it does it theoretically frees up some of your staff's capacity but then uh, i see a massive massively lost opportunity around taking that free capacity upskilling it reskilling it and reapplying it to these higher value problems the second part of that the, that project almost always falls by the wayside with my clients no matter how much i i pitch a fit and jump up and down well, for me, I, it's it's very interesting. So we are you know, we're looking forward to having that problem. So I, you know, the the one young man I have that is doing this for me, his his primary job is quality assurance, and 
yeah, I forget what this, oh, metrics, quality assurance and metrics, is, he's our lead on that. So, you know, instead of him, he's, he's coming up with this checklist of what we look at for each document, and a whole bunch of his peers look at the various documents depending on what they do. I'd love to get him to the point, where I want to do with him is, a lot of folks are asking us, I have an oversight role for DHS IT, for, um, and so, the lower level program, we can only do the majors right now, 300 million and above life cycle. That, those guys have to come to the government. They have to come to headquarters, rather, and they, because we have direct um, reporting requirements for them. But I would love to have him go visit each component, embed for a little while, and see how they're doing, because the smaller components, or, or the, the component level, have their own life cycles. I used to be at ICE myself, or actually I was at INS. I said I was old. So, uh, you know, we, each, each component has its own life cycle, so I, I want to go validate that that's all working well, right? And, and, and it meets the standards of what we kind of lay down from the headquarters, but we just can't get there. We just can't reach it. And I think that he has, there's, we can peel more layers of the onion from a quality assurance perspective as much as, we, if we can take more things out of his hand. And I think the same sort of thing applies to each one of the folks on my staff. We've got, you know, uh, the Agile folks, the system engineering lifecycle folks, uh, someone who does assessment and compliance and looks at the federal IT dashboard and makes sure that everything we're reporting there is good. And oh my gosh, that's perfect for, for RPA and AI. So, you know, but the overall, I'll, I'll finish and I'll let someone else talk for a moment, but the, you know, I really, with regard to that retraining, I I'm, I'm remain to be convinced on that, right? I don't do my own plumbing, I don't do my own car work anymore. I've been doing IT for almost 40 years. I'm not probably gonna be the guy that's gonna write the next great thing in IT or even identify what the next great thing is. And so, and the other federal folks I've got who, you know, between 10 to 20, 30 years, are, you know, some of whom, you know, been kind of doing this for a while. I, I really wanna make them smart consumers, but they may not be the people who are actually doing the coding, actually even doing, you know, some of the, some of the planning. I mean, I do intend to bring in smart vendors. I mean, that's what the whole thing's set up to do. I want to have managers who are smart consumers and, and to bring in the appropriate vendors with the latest and greatest thoughts. And uh, that's my thoughts, guys. So for us, you know, a lot of the staff that we're using, well, a lot of the, the, the processes that we're looking to you know, put through the RPA process and automate and, and, you know, make life good. So those are entry level staff, which we have trouble keeping, you know, staffed as it is. So for us, it's a little bit of a different paradigm. So they get their foot in the door at the entry level. They really like what they're doing, but they want to do something more, right? They don't want to be cutting and pasting things in emails and making sure that, you know, passwords are all good. And, you know, they, they want to be doing more. They, they actively are looking for additional, you know, that next step in their career. So for us, it's a matter of just, you know, having stabilization at that level, at the entry level, so that the, the bots will do that work for us and so that we can, you know, get a little bit more stable and not having that constant churn. Um, I will say, though, for the people who, you know, and, and so that's the way we're going to handle it. There's there's really not going to be staff where we need to, you know, physically move. They they, they do it on their own just because they want to uh, progress their career. But I would say from a shared service perspective, we have many technology efforts, and we don't view RPA as a technology effort. We view it as a as a business process effort, and we're trying to use business people with an a background in analytics or some sort of interest in that area to really drive this forward so that it's led by the business, you know, they control what processes get automated and that they're really in the driver's seat. So, but we do have other, you know, technologies that we're looking to implement to improve our service to our shared service customers. And so that's where really where we see a lot of those staff moving to. Um, you know, those are, that's naturally where they want to get the jobs generally in the first place. So that's where our staff really go to. And we do work with them to try to train them as they come in entry level and so trying to get that higher level education or whatever it may require to work on those types of projects. But that's where we're really excited because we can do, we hope to be able to do more of those types of technology projects and, you know, whether it be even customer service focused projects, you know, that's another area where we're trying to make improvements. So getting the staff into those areas where before we might not have had the opportunity to do that type of work because we had to keep that lower level staff, you know, at the constant, you know, looking at things that are very manual in nature. So that's for us, I mean, it's kind of the best of both worlds because we're growing and so that gives them many opportunities, you know, from a technology customer or, um, you know, other opportunities within the organization. 
Do we have another question? You've answered all of them. No, we nailed it, guys. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, personally, I feel much better about the way the world is going, thanks to the insight the three of you have offered. Um, please join me in thanking our panel.